Father God in heaven, thank you that we can come together on this, um, in this audience, Lord, and open your word. Thank you for this week that you have given us. Thank you for being with us through this week and for bringing us safely through another week to another Sabbath day, Lord. Father God, we thank you for your love and your blessings towards us. Some of us have had a hard week, Lord, and we, 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 we appreciate and we look forward to the Sabbath day of rest. Lord, um, I pray that as we open your word, that you will please forgive us our sins, that you will open our hearts and our minds, that you will touch our brain cells with understanding, and Holy Spirit, that you will bless us, that we may apply our, your word to our hearts and not only be hearers of your word, but doers of your word as well. I pray for every person that has joined us um, in this cyberspace. Whoever needs to get a message, Lord, speak to them personally and give them a message that they so desperately need today. I pray for each panelist that he has joined me. I pray for Kevin. I pray for Keith. I pray for myself, Lord. I pray that you will bless us as we open your word and <clears throat> that we may be clear and that we may be an encouragement to ever needs that, Lord, we are not perfect and we don't come here as a perfect people, but we are all sinners in need of your grace. And I pray that you will impart that grace to us now. I pray this with much thanksgiving in your loving and precious namesake. Amen. Okay. Thank you. Um, with that, I'd like to welcome everybody to um, this discussion of our lesson for the week that has gone by. Um, I am Kevin and I'll be facilitating our discussion today. Um, the other panelists with me are um, Dr. Colleen Saunders and then um, Keith Newton. Uh, we will we'll go through the lesson day by day and then we'll go through the discussions for each day and um, just share some um, insights into each day. Uh, and the point of this is to get you as a viewer excited for, for the lesson so that next week when you are watching this, um, if you haven't, then you can kind of um, follow along, kind of present your own discussion points at home as you watch. Um, I find it in interesting to do that when I'm not on the panel myself, uh, just to see if I agree or don't agree with the panelists, you know. Um, it's my time that I can enjoy with with God and I think that's what Sabbath is about. So without further ado, um, good day to my fellow panelists. How was the week for you? Hi, Kevin. <laughs> Just very tough. good. <laughs> Busy. I had a tough and I had a very good day. So <laughs> I think that's about <laughs> that that's a very accurate description of the week that's gone now. Yeah. Um, and what were what were some of your thoughts about the lesson just before we jump into it? Shall I go first? <laughs> well, yeah, that's fine. I, um, to be honest with you, I find this lesson a an experience of growth, of personal growth for myself, um, and 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 it's so applicable, not just only for witnessing but for one's relationships in general. And uh, I think you can just grow from it, honestly. I was um, again impressed with uh, Jesus and how being God, he was led by the Spirit. In that uh, he had the wisdom to be able to see deep, he saw past uh, what people exhibited, uh, past our perceptions, you know. Um, he saw this woman, what she really needed uh, instead of what she said. 
you know, and I thought uh, of how wise it is uh, for us to be led by the Spirit, to give us that insight, uh, because we all put up barriers, you know, we, we, we hide uh, 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 the truth. Um, and uh, sometimes we don't even know we do that. And uh, we need wisdom when we deal with people to understand that, um, that uh, they, are, uh, they have needs. They, they have needs. Sometimes they don't understand of, uh, what they need, you know. Yeah, those were my impressions. Yeah. What was yours, boss? Look, I I thoroughly enjoyed it because um, we all we all know the work that I do is I don't I don't enjoy much um, having to deal with the people that I work with because of just because of the nature of my work. If I'm dealing with somebody, it means that um, something went wrong. Mm -hmm. So. This lesson was, it was very nice in that I learned my attitude plays a big part in, in how, um, not how I come across, but how Christ comes across. Because it was Wednesday, I think, at the end of Wednesday, that spoke about how what we say and do around others has such an important impact. So when I saw that, I was very I, I was impressed. So I think God really spoke to me this week and I'm, I'm highly impressed with, with this week's lesson. So, um, I'm excited to get into it, um, for those reasons. But, um, I must say, um, it's not an easy thing to talk about because, um, our attitudes are not always the best. Being human, we do fall and we do have lapses in, um, I want to say judgment here, but we do have lapses where we do the wrong thing, even though we know what's right. And um, daily, I think Christ is trying so hard to help us with that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's where faith comes in. So, yeah, let's get, let's get into it. Um, we start with Sabbath and we talk about developing a winning attitude. Um, and we see the, the memory verse um, there found in 1 Peter 3 verse 15. And it says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you with meekness and with fear. Um, the meekness and fear part there, I think, is the operative section of the verse because without those, I think those are the two parts that relate to attitude. Um, and that's what we're talking about this week is our attitudes as Christians and how that attitude affects our witnessing and our interactions with others. But not just our interactions with others, God's interactions with us. Um, so we study we study Jesus's life and how um, he dealt with people and his amazing ability to accept and affirm people no matter who they were or where they came from. What Jesus cared about is where they were going, and so we see he can issue a scathing rebuke to a religious leader. Um, but he's able to um, embrace and receive the, the person who's struggling with sin um, and get that person to the point where they're witnessing. That person is now bringing hundreds, if not thousands of people um, to hearing the truth, you know, and not at any point did Jesus exhibit a sense of superiority or um, he didn't turn his nose up at anyone. He didn't even, I don't, I don't know of a section where Jesus exalts himself. In fact, God does that for him. So um, 
we're going to look at the way Jesus dealt with people and what we can learn from that and also what we need to change based on what Jesus did. Because um, even though we deal with people just like ourselves who are fallen um, because of sin and um, uh, we, we have to influence these people for the, for, for the kingdom just as Jesus did, um, but we have the responsibility here to treat these people with the respect that they deserve um, as per what God says, not what we think, but what God says. So did anyone else have a thought on, on Sabbath? Uh, Kevin, um, you know, when you read this verse in English, it says, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Now, I'm not speaking to you or for anybody else, but I did not properly understand that until I read it in Afrikaans. So, if you don't mind, let me read this verse to you in Afrikaans. Een teendeel erken in jylle harte Christus as die een wat seggenskap het. You see? Sanctify the Lord in your heart. See God as having the authority in your life. And then, and then it is, uh, you, you tread more softly when you deal with people, you know. And uh, it gave me great joy to read it. But let me, let me continue. As jylle dit doen, as jylle dit doen, en iemand vraag jylle uit oor die hoop wat in jylle leef, wees altyd recht om te reageer. I love it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kev. Um, Kev, um, if I can just um, add something there as well, and it's in line with what Keith said now. Um, you know, I, I read this word, this one word that comes out to me in the second par paragraph, and it's dignity. Yeah. Jesus, everyone with dignity. Um, and that tells me he had no hierarchy of respect of persons. And, 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 for Jesus, people were people, you know, yeah. and, and, and that is so beautiful to me because um, it is so human to, 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 to respect people who we put in on a pedestal and um, people who are from the lower echelons of society, we don't regard them much, but Jesus put everyone um, you know, like the saying goes, at the, foot, at the foot of the cross, everyone is equal. And Jesus knew where he was going and where he was coming from and that he was the creator. And everyone came from his hands. And so with that understanding, um, I think Jesus just related to everyone with dignity that they deserved. Yeah. And I like, thank you. Thank you, Keith, for the... The Afrikaans there, it, it really does bring it out so nicely. And it makes you it, it makes you realize your responsibility once you have um to to paraphrase recognized God in your heart, you know. But yeah, I won't take up much more time with with Sabbath. Let's move straight on to Sunday. Okay. All right, Sunday is my bit, um Sunday and Monday. So Sunday speaks to um, the receptivity of the gospel. And, um, you know, uh, it goes into this um, experience where Jesus went, was on his way to Samaria. And um, his disciples would have chosen another way. But Jesus, in, and the lessons tell us, the lesson tells us that the Holy Spirit um, uh, impressed on Jesus to go through Samaria. Because there he had an appointment, a divine appointment with this woman at Jacob's well. And he knew her so in depth that um, he, 
he actually um, spoke to her about her life experiences. And um, he engaged her while the disciples were gone. And when the disciples came back, they were amazed that Jesus actually sat and spoke to a Samaritan woman. And the background of this is that the Jews and the Samaritans were not on very good um, interactive terms. The Jews looked down on the Samaritans because uh, they didn't see them as equal to them in terms of their beliefs, in terms of their culture, in terms of their background. And there was constant conflict um, with, between the Jews and the Samaritans over doctrine and worship. And, and this animosity was decades old. So um, that is the setting in which Jesus met this woman. And so the disciples went off to get some food supplies. And when they came back, they were, like I said, amazed that Jesus spoke to this woman. And um, this woman, after she had spoken to Jesus and the things that he had said to her, we recall that he spoke to her about her life, about her background, about her, her, her uh, uh, fact that she wasn't married to her husband, the current man that she was living with, and that she had many men in her life. And this is a total stranger to her, but she saw in Jesus something different, and she knew that this was the Messiah. She knew that this was Yeshua HaMashiach after she had spoken to him. And um, the question is asked here, um, what was the ultimate result of Jesus' ministry in Samaria? Because Jesus, to me, was not just a man with present sight or hindsight. He was a man with foresight. And he knew what would be in the future. And I would like to think that every single interaction that Jesus had, he had in mind that person's future. And not only their present future on earth, but their eternal future in heaven. So um, the question is then asked, what was the ultimate result of Jesus's ministry in, in Samaria? Can I open that as a point of discussion? Sure. Um, Keith, do you want to go first or shall I? Uh, the, the, the verses are there, you know. Uh, it says in verse 4 of chapter 8, that therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. When you go to verse 14, now when the apostles were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. All of a sudden, this uh, outcast city, this zombie town, if you want to, you know, <laughs> uh, became a mission field. And the apostles now had free entry and could speak. And that is where Dr. So beautifully says, you know, that Jesus had foresight. And Kevin, you and I, and Doctor, must also have that foresight. And uh, before I forget, Kevin, you know what, what I love about Jesus? They come with the food and they urge Jesus to eat. <laughs> and Jesus says, <laughs> I've had food, you know, that you don't know nothing about. He is consumed with getting us to heaven, you know. He, he, he wants to uh, better our lives. This is a winning attitude to improve people's lives. You know, doctor says she she had, uh, she she is now a real doctor. I love that. I love that that expression. You know that um, she now has time to talk to people, to see people's burdens, and to 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 give a shoulder. You know, to help, and and that is that is for 
society, you know. Uh, that's my comment. Thank you. Yeah, and we never know, you know, we don't know how far our actions go. So we may think it's just us listening to somebody, just us telling someone, you know, I know you're going through something difficult. I, I may not understand it. I may not have been there, but I know that Jesus knows. Jesus knows what you are going through and um, he wants to be there for you. I mean, all, you, all we have to do is just talk to someone, tell somebody that, and them hearing that could mean the world of difference to them um, to the point where they now start growing closer to Jesus and their lives are impacted the way we never thought. Um, in the same way, the disciples never thought that a woman, an outcast woman from Samaria would be able to bring so many people to Jesus to hear the truth. Um, and yet, there they were, listening to Jesus talk to these people um, who this woman had told uh, about her story and her interaction with Jesus. It's absolutely it's Thank you so fun. much um, for your input, uh, Kevin. And, um, you know, the, the, I think the beautiful thing about this was that the far-reaching impact of, of, of Jesus' conversation with this woman, immediately after their conversation, she went into Samaria and she brought the people to Jesus and, uh, and, and, and they could then hear the gospel. But also, I believe, and it says here in, in, um, in Acts um, 8, verse 4, Five and fourteen, that you know that 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 Keith so clearly outlined that Jesus laid the foundation of receptivity for the early Christian church when they go out and make disciples. That Samaria would be more receptive because of this interaction with Jesus, uh, with this of this woman with Jesus, and then her subsequent. Um, uh, a testimony, as it were, to the rest of the people in Samaria. And they recalled that experience. And they were more receptive about the gospel of this Jesus, um, who had so kindly interacted with him at the time when he was at uh, the, the, the well with this woman from Samaria. So um, that is what Sunday speaks to. It speaks about receptivity for the gospel. Jesus laid that foundation in his interaction with that woman for the future of the gospel to be spread when the early Christian church evangelized Samaria. And so, you know, um, we end off here uh, with a statement that says, we never know for sure the impact of our words and actions on others, either for good or for bad. And I remember, you know, way back when I was at school, there was a little um, rhyme that said, three things come not back. And it says, remember, three things come not back. The arrow sent upon its track. It will not swerve. It will not sway its speed. It flies to wound or slay. The spoken word so soon forgot by thee, but it hath perished not. In other hearts, tis living still and doing work for good or ill. And the lost opportunity that cometh back no more to thee. In vain thou weepest, in vain doth yearn. These three will never more return. And it's written by an anonymous author, but I think it's so true for what we're talking about here. So, you know, our words and our actions on others either have an influence for good or for bad. And then, hence, we must be careful about how... We say what we say and what we say and do in the presence of others and also to them. And I think that is a huge learning experience. Um, before I move on to Monday, does anyone have another comment? Okay. Let's move on to Monday. Monday speaks to an attitude of adjustment. And here... Um, just as an opening remark, our lesson reminds us that 
our attitudes often de determine our ability to influence others. A harsh, critical, and unfriendly attitude is going to drive people away from you. And even if you are able to witness your words, no matter how truthful, are much less likely to be received. And uh, I think this is just so poignant because, you know, sometimes um, people think that you have to be loud and expressive to, 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 to be harsh and critical. But you know that silent, violent attitude at times um, can, can also be quite hurtful. Uh, all you need to be is surly and, 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 and like they say in Africa, it's kortaf, you know, brush people off and, 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 and not engage them nicely. Um, it can drive people away. But having said that, yeah, in, Sun, in Monday's lesson, we have two women. And Jesus dealt with those two women in seemingly diametrically opposed ways. Um, and what did you guys think of that? I was a little bit taken aback. When I saw these two contrasts and then coming to the end of the lesson, I really understood what it was all about. What was going through your minds when you read that? So it's difficult because it's like, um, it's like reading the end of a book first and then coming back to the start because you know, it's Jesus. You, you kind of expect that it's for the woman's good. So even though he's being a abrasive um as we would think or even though he's ig ignoring us so to speak um it's not like we don't at all suspect malice of jesus we think you know okay something something is coming of this or maybe this woman um isn't at the right place yet and then i just want to that's the story of that experience if i can just butt in the given what happened this woman and Jesus in the interaction. So, so, sorry, say so again. Um, I just would like you to summarize for us shortly. Oh, what yeah. In this experience, uh, uh, interaction between Jesus and this woman, the first so, one that you talked about. Look, so, you, we see Jesus and and the disciples. Um, I guess traveling, and this woman comes there and. She calls to Jesus, but Jesus ignores her and the disciples are getting annoyed and they tell Jesus, look, send this woman away or do something, but uh, deal with it. And Jesus tells them, no, just hold on. Why, why must I deal with it so abrasively now and so rashly? And anyway, um, they carry on and eventually the woman gets to Jesus and she, she, she tells, she, she gets his attention now and she's like, listen, I need your help, please. Um, and Jesus is so impressed by this that he tells her, you know, your faith is, you have great faith. You have great faith. And so I hope it works up for you. The, 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 the punchline is, what did Jesus say to her before that and what was her reaction? So, um, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. Jesus tells her first, he, he, he he tells her that it's not good to to give um, the children's food to the dogs, and she says to to Jesus quite witting, quite quick wittedly, um, that you know even the dogs eat the crumbs um, off the master's table, um, yeah. and I think Jesus saw a uh, uh, um, thirst for, or not a thirst, but he saw her faith in in that statement that she could see through what he was what he was saying to her oh absolutely and i just i just love this because now we get to the second woman and the second woman was mary magdalene and yeah jesus is invited to um simon's house and um for a meal and uh, usually what happens is the guest uh, 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 feet are washed by the host 
But in this incident, nobody washed Jesus' feet. And so... Now this stand is in there and she takes her most precious, precious possession. And it, it was a, a, an alabaster jar of spikenard perfume. And uh, there's protest, you know, about wasting money and about this should not be done. And then Jesus says, no, 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 no. Leave her alone. What has she done to you? All she's doing is she is honoring me because you, Simon, have not even washed my feet when I came here. But this woman has washed my feet and dried them with her hair. And this, this was an action of love. So here we see, in contrast, that's why I said Jesus reacts to these two women in diametrically opposed um, attitudes or ways. He's very harsh with the one woman and he's very gentle and kind to the other woman. The one woman being a Samaritan, the other one being a Jew. And so I'm asking myself, does it have anything to do with that? And then I asked myself, but there's a deeper meaning to this. And, um, you know, I looked at this and I thought, and again, Afrikaans give, <laughs> went through my mind. I think it's such, I think it's such a beautiful, beautiful, a uh, 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 contrast for, for me, what, what, what came to my mind it was that, um, and the Afrikaans phrase would be, Jesus said, a innige mense kennis gehad. And if I have to translate that, I would say that Jesus had a profound in-depth knowledge and insight into the hearts of people. He knew that the first Samaritan woman could take a harsh abrasive word because she was feisty and she wouldn't give up. And, 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 and she was, she was persistent and she knew what she wanted. She wanted Jesus and she wanted her daughter to be um, delivered from demon possession. And then there was the Mary Magdalene who was fragile and broken in metal. And she had been, really, if we can say it to Helen back in her experience. And Jesus knew that if he had spoken one more harsh word to her, he might just drive her away for good and break her completely, utterly and totally. And, um, and that, that to me uh, uh, were, were two totally different approaches, but both were winning uh, uh, essentials and winning attitudes because Jesus knew people so well. And I thought to myself, you know, before I interact with people on that kind of level, I need to sit back, listen, learn, and get to know what the person I'm interacting with is all about before speaking my own my own word what do, what do you think he? doctor uh, it is the insight and the foresight of jesus uh, that we need so desperately um you know it reminded me this me of uh, the words of the Old Testament prophet that a, 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 he, he will not break a, a broken reed, he will not uh, 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 deaden a, 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 a flame that is busy going out, you know. So mm. he...
on this flame um, uh, that is that he that could easily be put out. So Jesus knew, but in the in the first woman's instant, he had more than just this woman. He had disciples to teach. Yes. You know, and he needed to teach them uh, that uh, uh, people have a deep need and we mustn't give up on them so easily. You know, uh, she didn't give up. Uh, she was tenacious and uh, I admire her for that. I mean, firstly, he told her, I have come, I have not come, I've come to the house of Israel. You know, <laughs> and, and then he tells her um, about the dogs and, and she says, uh, uh, you know, the puppies eat from the, uh, the crumbs. So, yes, those were my ideas that he didn't uh, um, put out a, f uh, a flame that was busy going out. And uh, uh, I love the way Jesus had this foresight and insight to people's uh, problems, you know. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, I'm done with my part. So um, I, th I think when, when, we, when we adjust our attitudes, um, it, 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 um, it, it does a lot, not only for our witnessing, but for, for life in general and our relationships in general as well. Over to, the, to, to I think it's uh, Keith next. <laughs> I think you've muted yourself, Keith. I thank you, Doctor. <laughs> I'm speaking <laughs> to myself now. All right, so it's presenting the truth in love. Yes. Okay, so our lesson points out very clearly to us that friendship alone does not win people to Christ. Okay, yes. do not think only because you're a nice, good friend, you have uh, lunch together, you run together, that uh, people will accept Christ. You have to be intentional when you witness. You know, friendship will open the doors, mm. but friendship alone will not bring people to Christ. But unfriendly attitudes may drive people from Christ. We need to uh, understand that as soul winners. You understand? And uh, the, other, the other point that the lesson makes is uh, how important it is that we make a habit of looking for the good in people as opposed to the bad. And then the lesson goes on to point out that we often look for the bad to make ourselves look good. Now, if ever you've met such a person, uh, they are offensive. Uh, that's, that's the only word I have for them, you know. So, people need the Lord. And we need to we need to understand that. And the example is very clear. And that's why uh, my concentration was a little bit bad uh, at the beginning because I was turning to Second Thessalonians, uh, where we see a good example of Paul uh, uh, complimenting the Thessalonians in Second Thessalonians one one to four. It's Paul and Silvanus. And Timotheus, uh, unto the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace unto you. Watch Paul greet, you know, and peace from God our Father, our Father, your Father, my Father, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you. Now, when when people speak like that to you, you know, you are warmed Absolutely. and you are willing to listen. Brethren, 
as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. He compliments, hello, Paul is just like Jesus. He says exactly what Jesus said to the woman. You have great faith. Your faith grows exceedingly. And the charity, the love, the brother lived the vachel of You see, every one of you all toward each other aboundeth so that we ourselves, we glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulation that you endure. Now when uh, I, all I have to say is no can Paul ma for my skill not so civil but <laughs> you know his opening remark shows me that he sees worth in me, you know, and I, 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 I really like that about presenting the truth in love, because we can present the truth in a very bad way, and uh, that is not um, Christ-like. Ellen G. White's statement on the importance of a positive relationship is remarkable. Listen to her. If we would humble ourselves before God, as ons sien wie het seggenskap in ons lewe. Mm. And be kind mm. and courteous mm. and tender-hearted and pitiful, just like Jesus, there would be 100 conversions to the truth when now there is only one. Mm. If that isn't motivation for us to be kind, and to be intentional. Don't be kind only. Be kind so that people can see their need of Christ. Present Jesus to, to them in a kind way. Don't be afraid to do that. Somebody, believe it or not, Cherise gave me and her mother, her mother and I, to, uh, to, to, to use English properly, <laughs> her mother and I are present. Uh, where we went for pedicure and this lady was washing my feet you know and uh, I had come from the lesson so I was intentional and um, uh, I spoke to her and uh, then I, uh, 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 she complimented me about my age you know and I said to her uh, uh, how old is your father? She says, my father's late. Mm. I said, okay, how old was he? She says, 44. Mm. I said to her, you know what? My oldest daughter is 47. Mm. I'm your father as from today. Mm. Now, the next thing shocked me. I said, what was wrong with your father? He died of COVID. Wow. Wow. People need the Lord. I had spoken to her about Jesus before I knew her father died of COVID uh, 19, you know. So uh, we need to we need to understand to be kind and courteous and tender hearted and pitiful. And you guys, how did you feel about that section of the lesson? Look, I partic this this part particularly resonated with me because um, I, I I take special care to be um, empathetic where I can. Um, I know that a lot of the people I meet, I won't always understand what they're going through, but if I can empathize with them, I can make a connection with them and. Um, for a while, I've held that as long as I can make a connection with you, I then have a an opportunity to talk to you again, and you feel comfortable to talk to me if there's something that's bothering you. If if some if you feel like um, you would like to um, discuss something, and then I have the opportunity to witness to you because now we are 
in a place where um, my Jesus can help you with your problems. And even if he doesn't, I can try to, to be his hands in the situation. Obviously, with much prayer and um, humility, uh, because that is, I think that is exactly how Jesus got to people. Yeah. He knew them where they were and he ministered to, to their needs. And then he said to them, as, as we are told, follow me. Except in my situation, I wouldn't be saying follow me. I would be saying follow this Jesus who you've seen working now for you. So wow. I, I, it's, be, it's, it's my, my life's mission to do that for someone. One person, if I can. Uh, <laughs> good. Thank you, Kevin. Doctor, you want to say something? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm I, just uh, sitting here and thinking that, um, you know, Kevin comes from a point of view of not having much interaction with people. I come from a point of view where at work I have interaction with people <laughs> constantly. And being human, you do get exhausted. Uh, you do, you meet so many people from so many different walks of life with so many different attitudes. And um, I'm thinking that if we need to perpetuate this kind of attitude that Jesus had of being kind and compassionate and tender hearted, um, we need to be constantly in tune with the Holy Spirit. Amen. We need constantly in tune with our own emotions, what we are feeling at that point in time. And that is called emotional intelligence. Uh, and, and, and one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. There are times when you are not going to feel like being compassionate. There are times when you are not going to feel like being kind. But Jesus says, be kind anyway. Be compassionate anyway. Because it's not about us. It's not about you. It's about his mission. And if we are not kind and compassionate and understanding in our interaction with people, we are going to thwart his mission. And, 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 and I think that is what um, I wanted to say, that we need the Holy Spirit to give us a high degree of emotional intelligence to be in touch with what we are where we are at at that particular point in time so that we can respond in a Christ-like way um, as, as Jesus would need of us. Yes, and that's what our, 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 our lesson is saying, Doctor, that we must present the truth in love and I value your, uh, your, your point about the Holy Spirit because do not attempt uh, uh, soul winning or uh, uh, without the Holy Spirit you are going to make a mess out of, of things you know you need the guidance you need the presence you need the control of the Holy Spirit and uh, that is uh, uh, Tuesday we move to Wednesday if you don't mind um, the foundation of acceptance is the foundation of acceptance it is very 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 clear christ accepted me i don't want to steal uh, uh paul's uh, uh fire you know uh, thunder when he says chief of sinners he is you know but if christ accepted me the least i can do because Christ is pure, Christ is holy, Christ is God, Christ is divine, Christ is creator, Christ is redeemer, Christ is our coming king. If he can accept Keith Newton, mm. surely Keith can accept Joe Bro uh, uh, So, you know, surely Keith can do that. And, and, and that is the foundation, I think, of acceptance, of being tolerant about uh, people's uh, faults, failings, or if you want to, sin. 
you know, uh, try to live with people in a beautiful relationship without having um, their, their sin ever before you. Remember yours, forget theirs, you know. All right, so Romans 15, 77 and Ephesians 4, 32, how would you describe the foundation of all acceptance? What is the essence of an accepting attitude? And Romans 5, uh, 15, 7 in the ISV says, Therefore, accept one another just as the Messiah accepted you. And then comes the phrase, mm. for the glory of God. Now, doctor, yes, if sir. there's one thing I want to do is mm. glorify God, mm. make Jesus happy. That's mm. something I want to do. And if that means accepting Kevin, Man, I will do it with all my heart. Even <laughs> Kevin is a nice guy, you know. But what I mean is, uh, I need to do that for the glory of God. And then uh, Ephesians 4.32 says, And be kind to one another. You and I, ma'am. We, we ought to be kind one to another. Why? It's just like Jesus. It's like our Master, our Savior. Compassionate. Compassionate. Understanding that sometimes you, doctor, will not have it all together. You'll have a hard day. And I'll come with my big mouth and say, Oh, you look like you've had a hard day. Don't <laughs> feel bad. <laughs> it's because I love you that I speak. <laughs> just as a, you know, forgiving one another. Yes. Before we ask for forgiveness, Kevin, we need to forgive one another. That's nothing. You know, we, we, we have to have that attitude. I don't, I, don't, I don't care about that. That's okay. It's my friend. It's my brother. It's my sister. Forgiving one another. I'm not saying, I'm not saying we have to be callous. I'm not saying we have to be, we have to tramp on people. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying be kind. Before, before somebody has to say, hey, do you know how it, do you know what it means to say, oh, I'm sorry. You know, you know, it takes a lot out of somebody. Now, if you can, if you can spare them that, that burden, uh, how nice it would be. Forgiving one another. Why? As God has forgiven you in Jesus. God has forgiven you. God, uh, hey, man. Hey, people, come on. Man. God has not only forgiven me, mm. He has paid for me. Mm. He, he has taken my filth on Him so that I can be free. Now you mean I can keep somebody else. One day I'm sitting in a car uh, with another crushed Christian brother um, on a rainy day. Our, our, our windows are all mussed up and we've got the wipers on, you know, in Commissioner Street. And along comes two drunk people. They are leaning on each other and crossing the road. And he says to me, Keith, those people are drunk. And they know that they have to lean on each other. You and I are Christian, but we want to live apart from one another. You know, come on. We need to learn the lessons, the foundation of acceptance. In these two passages, the Apostle Paul presents the principles underlying our acceptance of one another. Because Christ has forgiven and accepted each one of us, how can we, how can we possibly refuse to forgive and accept one another? Now, my 10 minutes for this section is almost up, you know, and I still want to say so much. He accepts you anyway, not because of your own goodness. Why? But because of His. You see, He is good. That's why he accepts us. 
you know uh, and and we you know, we need to understand that to fail to do this is to neglect to love we must care enough to share life changing eternal truths with our friends you know my sister malin she has a way of reprimanding you hard and then she says quite truthfully if i don't reprimand you i don't love you i accept that with all my heart with all my heart she's reprimanded me before i was a christian on a sunday morning when i am laying and reading newspaper and she's working alone she used to say to me um no hobbiki slap no hobbiki slamer so come your armudo so has a weapon the man she's been reprimanded i love her for that because i understand that she's reprimanding doesn't the bible says those the lord loves he reprimands okay so we must we must care enough to share the gospel with people isn't it isn't it hey people if hubby albany didn't share the gospel with me i don't know where i would have been you know biblical truth presented humbly in christ spirit with a loving attitude yeah. wins hearts and changes lives it changes mine it changed mine i am determined to help somebody else on his yeah. on uh, on this way that's my comments on thursday please be, feel free to share yours i'm going to mute myself so i could give you a uh, well uh if you kind of brought in thursday's the the introduction to thursday there so i'm excited but i'm going to give the doctor a chance quickly <laughs> no, no no just just one quick word um you know as as keith was reading this that um uh, uh it came to my mind that um secular psychologists uh, coined the term of unconditional positive regard and this for me speaks so much to what this lesson is trying to say here that um jesus accepted people just as they were without judgment without um a uh, a uh, a uh, a uh, uh, bringing them down but at the same time his uh his intention was to lift them up um to lift them up uh, to to the standard we we he created us to be you know but in love um because of his grace and his mercy and and i think that as sinful human beings we have so much to learn there because there are so the the we can be so judgmental we can be so harsh we can be so unkind and so unloving that it hurts people um you know and 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 um and i and i think when we see our own our own sinfulness in the light of the cross we we can relate to other people better and 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 in a sense with unconditional positive regard the kind of unconditional positive regard that jesus had and that's that's about what i need to say yeah thank you thank you doctor um it's the truth lovingly presented makes all the difference um yeah. and we see that jesus didn't neglect presenting the truth for love's sake because in fact that wouldn't be love um just as keith so aptly pointed out in the previous um section there it's it, it there there's no conflict between the truth and love because when you love somebody you will tell them the truth however you will do it the right way um mm. and that right way is only possible when you are um under the guidance of the holy spirit when you have spent time talking to god and getting in tune with him first before you go out and try to um get someone else in tune with him so yeah we we see that when truth is presented humbly and kindly it's a statement of love um and jesus is love is the way the truth and the life and is the only way 
So is grace saved us? But we have to understand that it also saves others. So that helps us to be tolerant of other people because we see that just as it saved us, it needs to save other people. It's not us who save people. It's God's grace. So, um, you know, without that, without that, um, I want to say hard hitting side of, of love, we end up with sentimentalism, which is not useful to anybody. Um, mm -hmm. we, we can't grow as a community. We can't grow as people. We can't grow, um, as friends. We can't even grow our relationships if we don't have truth. And sometimes that truth is difficult to accept, but love makes it easier to accept. And the previous days, um, have brought it out so nicely that it doesn't matter or rather mm -hmm. what you say matters much less than how you say it because how you say something means the difference between somebody coming to Christ and somebody turning their back completely on anything that has to do with God. Um, the New Testament writers, they, they have a way of bringing opposing concepts together in such a way that you understand the balance between them. Um, love and truth, grace and law, uh, compassion and honesty. I mean, in, in, this, in the verses there, um, 1 Peter 3 verse 15, 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, and um, Titus 3 verse 4 and 5, we see that these, these things are, are, are brought out the love the honesty um the 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 grace however they are not brought out alone they are governing principles to all of these um mm. so we, we cannot have one without the other and mm. peter admonishes us to always be ready to give a defense for the hope that's in us however with meekness and humility it's very important that we remember those things because often we can, it's very easy to fly off on a tangent and, and become so engrossed in our own sense of, um, I guess what happens is we, we, we are so happy about the connection we have with Jesus that we tend to forget that if we're not careful, it comes across as self-righteous, um, sure. and proud, boastful, even when we have nothing to be boastful about, um, we we in and of ourselves are not worthy of anything um but but because jesus loves us he has made us worthy and so we need to understand that um we cannot be lording ourselves over other people and coming across as superior we need to look at where they are consider that and in our minds while we even talking to to people mm -hmm. We need to be thinking, um, what would you have me say, God? Where am I going with this? So in other, in other words, we need to know what we believe, why we believe it. And we need to be ready to explain it in such a way that, um, the person we're explaining it to understands that we are not doing this out of, um, our own inflated ego. But it's because we realize the gravity and the greatness of the issues that we are dealing with here. It's not, it's not simply uh, whether or not you like me, but it's where this person we're speaking to spends eternity, where we spend eternity. Mm -hmm. And so, um, again, we see Paul counseling Timothy, preach the word, be ready at all times. Um, convince, exhort, rebuke, however, do it with long suffering and teaching. And um, the way he uses teaching here is not the conventional sense where I am your superior and you need to listen mm. to me so that you can get somewhere. It's, it's, mm. we are walking on this journey together. And at the end of it, your success um, reflects well on me. And that's not the point here, the point is your success. So um, 
we, we are called to present the truth in love with meekness and humility. And God invites us to join him in, in sharing this message lovingly, acceptingly, and with an attitude that is lowly and an attitude that doesn't um, stifle other people, but that lifts them up. So it's, it's a lot to think about, but it's important because the world we live in is, is dying, um, especially without Christ. But we are the ones who, are, who, who know Christ. Um, we are fortunate enough to have been exposed to it. And if this person who exposed us to it felt that we were not receptive, that we were not worthy um, of their efforts, where would we be? Absolutely. So the question we have to, to ponder is, if someone asked you, why are you a Christian? How would you respond? Wow. I know um, if, if, if one of um, my fellow panelists would like to share with us, um, even you can even share your comments with us now, that will, that will be fine. You know, um, I would say that uh, I'm a Christian because um, I I don't deserve God's love, His grace, and His mercy, and I cannot see that any other religion offers unmerited favor like Jesus does. That means favor and grace without me having to deserve it, without me having to work for it, without me having to pay penance for it, without me having to feel that I have to make an effort on my part um, to, to, to deserve God's, God's righteousness, His love, His grace, and His mercy. Because the Bible teaches me that our righteousness is like filthy rags in His sight. All I need to do is say, Jesus, I accept you. Will you accept me? You know, and I accept your, 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 your sacrifice on the cross for me. And this is one religion where I find that non judgmental, unconditional love, grace, and mercy. And, 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 and it's, it's so humbling. It is so deep. It is so profound that you cannot just but want to follow Jesus and be like him, you know, and, and, and allow him to make you to be like him. Yes, thank you, Doctor. And, you know, I'm, I must say, for um, for all of its merits, Christianity does have um, a lot of pitfalls, and that is Christianity outside of Christ's guiding and leading in our lives. Um, mm -hmm. We can end up feeling very we can end up being very judgmental um, yes. without realizing it, um, and that's why it's so important that we constantly stay um, cognizant of what God has done for us. And also, we need to keep him in view at all times. As soon as we lose sight of him, we end up um, in a very dangerous place. In, because, you know, when we look at Christ, it's in Christ that we see the tenderness of the shepherd, the affection of the parent, the matchless grace and um, of the compassionate Savior. His blessings he presents in the most alluring terms. Um, mm. And he's not merely content to just announce these blessings. No, mm. he presents them in the most attractive way to excite a desire to possess them. So we as his servants are to present the riches of the glory of the unspeakable gift. The wonderful love of Christ will melt and subdue hearts when mere reiteration of doctrines would accomplish nothing. Sure. And we are exhorted to, 
to comfort God's people um, that, you know, he brings us good, that, that there's good tidings, that we are not to be afraid um, because God is there for us. So um, if you want to read the rest of that, that um, excerpt that I read there, it's found in Desire of Ages, pages 826 and 827. Um, but this lesson was one that I'm, I will probably read a few more times um, just to remind myself about these things, not, not just in my, um, my walk with Christ, but also the way I treat other people because um, I must say I, have, I am guilty of being less than compassionate, um, not as tender-hearted as I should have been, unkind even in some, some situations. But um, my responsibility as a Christian is to, to look at that and pray. Ask God for forgiveness and for guidance and strength to do better in um, the days, the months, the weeks that lie ahead in my life. And I, I pray that for each and everyone watching this, that we will ask God to give us a winning attitude, an attitude of ac acceptance, um, an attitude of love, meekness, and kindness, so that Christianity will be attractive to people and effective also. Um, but yeah, anyone else with a comment? If not, okay, I'm going to ask Keith to close in prayer for us. Sorry, Keith, you're on mute there. Eh? I beg your pardon. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you very much for your word. We stand reprimanded, but in your love, Lord. We cherish the example set by Jesus. We value the Holy Spirit's urging, prompting, and encouraging us to do better. And we love you for your patience, Lord, that after all is said and done, it will not be because of our goodness, but because of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ's goodness, that we will gain uh, salvation uh, eventually in your kingdom. We thank you for the difference that Christianity has made in our lives. And we pray that it will be beautiful and acceptable to those who have not decided for it. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, I'm Dr. Randy Bevins. Today, I'm going to tell you about a product that will reduce your risk of heart attack. It is at least as effective as maintaining an ideal body weight, reducing high blood pressure, reducing cholesterol, or stopping smoking. It is virtually free, and there are no side effects in healthy people. This product, if taken in recommended amounts, will cure or significantly reduce the incidence of many diseases. These include kidney stones, gallbladder disease, constipation, urinary tract infections, high blood pressure, glaucoma, and venous blood clots. Although not yet proven scientifically, this product is thought to be important in reducing or improving most diseases known to man. 
On top of that, there are no adverse effects in healthy people. In fact, overall health and well-being are improved. Have you figured out what we're talking about? Two hydrogen atoms bound to one oxygen atom forming H2O, or water. A study published in the American Journal of Epidemiology showed that those who drank more than five glasses of water per day had significantly less death from coronary heart disease compared to those who drank less than two glasses per day. Dr. Chan, the principal investigator, wrote, basically, not drinking enough water can be as harmful to your heart as smoking. Drinking over five glasses of water per day will cut the risk of coronary heart disease in half. This has an equal or greater effect than any other well-known preventive measure. The researchers also noted that if people drank anything other than pure water, their risk for coronary heart disease actually increased. This includes tea, coffee, soda, and even fruit juices. Dr. Chan noted, people need to be made aware that there is a difference, at least for heart health, whether they get their fluids from plain water or from sodas. Perhaps you're wondering, how is it that something as simple as drinking water has such a substantial effect on our coronary health? Well, it has been shown that dehydration elevates blood stickiness and increases blood elements that promote clotting. When elevated, these are risk factors for coronary heart disease. So how much water should you drink? Here's a good rule of thumb. Take your body weight in pounds and divide it in half. That number is the recommended number of ounces you should drink every day. Naturally, your need for water increases with exercise, warmer temperatures, and fever. When dealing with these situations, use your common sense and make sure you drink enough. It is helpful to drink at least one glass of water as soon as you wake up in the morning, as well as a glass of water at bedtime. This has been shown to significantly reduce your heart attack risk for that night. Your body is 75% water and your brain is 85% water. Water is more than a simple solvent. It is important in many body functions. With all of these benefits, why don't we hear more about water? Could it be? Because you cannot patent water, there's no profit in its research or its promotion. As you can see, in our goal to live longer, better, healthier lives, we need to develop the habit of drinking generous amounts of water in conjunction with reducing or eliminating the consumption of tea, coffee, soda, and fruit drinks. We just need plain, pure water. Because of the risk of BPA and plastics, it's best to avoid most bottled water. It's a good idea to filter tap water this can be effective in most situations with a good charcoal filter. This will also save you money in the long run. For those of us with well water, it's a good idea to have your water tested to make sure that it does not contain toxins such as heavy metals. So, in our goal to live 120 years of age, drinking plenty of water is definitely one of the most important habits that we can develop. Dude, I'm trying to pay attention here. Oh. What? Dude, when am I supposed to give offerings? Whenever you see the basket? Yeah, I know that, but like, should I give every time there's a call in the church? No. And what if I don't have anything to give? Am I sinning if I don't give? Because like, it seems easy to determine if I'm being dishonest with God regarding my tithes. But how can I be sure that I'm doing the right thing with my promise? Dude, calm down and listen to Carlito here. It's actually pretty simple. There are two main types of offerings. Okay. One is regular systematic offering, which we call promise. And two, sporadic or occasional free will offerings, which can be given for special appeals or projects, but only beyond and above promise. I see. So when should I... Hold on, I'm getting there. 
Now, our most fundamental motivation to give promise, you know, regular and systematic offerings, should never be based on the needs of others, nor on any call made at church, or even on personal feelings or sympathies, you know what I mean? Yeah. Our motivation must always be based on God's initiative to bless us with an income or increase, and be given as first fruits every time God gives us a financial blessing. For He is ever the first to give. So we give when He gives, and after His giving. Exactly. And if you have received nothing from Him, and your income is zero, your tithe and promise will also be zero. And you're considered faithful. On the other hand, if you don't return tithe or give promise every time you have an income, you fail to recognize God as the origin of life and of all blessings. Fair enough. Everything makes sense now. You sure? Yep. Okay. All right. Now stop poking me. As you return your tithe and give your promise, be grateful to God, who is the origin of life and all blessings. May we put our desires last and God first. Gracious God, we thank you this day, O Lord. The Sabbath is indeed a delight, a blessing given by your hand, and we thank you for giving us a day of rest. We are the church united as we pray from different locations, connected through something more marvelous than technology. Your Spirit, dear Father, filling us with hope and vision. We come first of all with thanksgiving, dear Lord. Thank you for the many blessings we have experienced in this time of social distancing. Old friends reconnecting, some households learning about togetherness, others enjoying more quality time with you in scripture and prayer. Thank you for the joy of food and the beauty of music, dear Lord. Thank you for the springtime season, which is lifting us with a promise of new life. Lord, this morning, we come together with lament as well. This virus has caused so much loss here and around the world. So many suffer, so many families grieve, and we don't know when it will end, dear Father. We lament the financial burden of this pandemic and that it has fallen heavily, dear Lord, on the poorest, with inequality standing out more sharply than usual. This morning, dear Father, we think of the elderly and those less fortunate in our church who are unable to join us on these social platforms. Father, we realize that they may feel lonely and disconnected during this time. Lord, we bring our families who are bereaved before you, we think of the Adams family, Abderbu, Euster, Pretorius, and Sequoi families. Lord, we know there are many more, but we think of them this morning. Lord, there are more families devastated by illness and disease as well. We also bring the family of Nathaniel Bradley Julius, the 16-year-old boy who was killed by police recently. Father, we think of the two young girls who were raped in Cajiso. We pray for their families as well, dear Lord. Father, you know that gender-based violence is rampant in our communities, in our country. Oh God, we pray for the victims and we ask that you will bring sense to mankind. We know that racism is one of the roots of injustice, dear God. So we ask that you will help us to love our neighbor as ourselves. We continue to pray for a vaccine for, for this virus, dear Father. Give insight to the researchers, bless the medical professionals and essential workers as we pray for a scientific breakthrough. Give wisdom to our church leaders, Father, making difficult decisions about how to do ministry during such a time as this. Help them find that fine balance between opening our churches and safeguarding our members' health. Keep us healthy, dear Father, and help us care for one another, dear Lord. We trust in you because you have been with us, showing us the faithful path in good time 
and bad. And dear God, your word promises that you will be with us come what may and grant us the peace that we are looking for, that we are searching for, dear Father, and give us the assurance that you will never leave us. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Good morning boys and girls. Today we are going to be doing a Bible lesson and the lesson's name is Purity Glass of Water. But first let us close our eyes and pray. Excuse me. Thank you Jesus for the wonderful morning you've given us. Thank you that we are all awake and that we are all feeling good today. Please bless us as we're going to learn a lesson now and whatever we learn let us apply it into our daily lives. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. So, today I have got two things with me, a glass of water and some food coloring. As you can see, there's nothing in the glass of water. So you guys can do this lesson on your own also if you want to do it. Our Bible verse is taken from Proverbs 22 verses 1 and it reads as follows. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. So I have a glass of water in my hands and I got this water from the tap. So it's clean water, pure, pure, clean of impurities, just plain pure water. On a hot day, who doesn't like a nice cold glass of water? It looks pretty good, doesn't it? But in this hand, I've got some red food coloring. And if we take some food coloring and dip just one drop into the water, what happens? The water becomes red. You can still see through the water, but it's cloudy with color. You know, if we add more water in, the color will still stay red, even though it would go to a lighter red. So the lesson is, no matter how much water we add into our lives, we will still be pollute, polluted. All it takes is one lie or one sin for us to pollute our lives. Um, people know you, if people know you to be honest and polite, who obeys their parents and follows the rules, they see you like a clean glass of water. But it only takes one lie, one act of sin to pollute the water. Suddenly, people don't see you the same way anymore, do they? And you can work and work all you want to to improve your reputation. But that sin is still going to be there. The only way you can truly restore this, fix this glass of water is to dump it all out, rinse the cup and fill it up again. The only person who can do this for us is Jesus. It's hard to maintain that good reputation. None of us are perfect and spotless, but it's a lot harder to clean up a bad re reputation once it's gone bad. That's why we must always be careful to tell the truth, to be obedient, to listen to our parents and to live life like Christ so that our situations don't become polluted by sin. So now we are going to pray and we're going to ask Jesus that he enters into our lives and helps us take, get rid of all of the pollution in our lives. Let's pray. Excuse me. Thank you, Jesus, for this lesson. Thank you that you are always here for us. Thank you that you, all, you love us and that you died on the cross of Calvary for our sins. Please bless us in our lives. Let us always remember to stay true and faithful to you and that no matter what we do, we need to do it with you in our minds and you in our hearts. Please bless us in the rest of the hours of the day that lies ahead of us. Um, let us be good boys and girls and listen to our mommies. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you.
talk about such love. Don't you love your fellow men? But you know who gave you that love? There's only one person. And we're going to see how much we love him. Because he's never given up on you. Sing with us today. This beautiful song.
I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a privilege it is for me to be able to share a word with you. And I hope that as we spend time together, that we'd both find a blessing, that we'd both leave here or leave this page enriched. At this present moment, I want to avert your attention to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, and it reads as follows. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Our subject title for this morning is taken from the book Steps to Christ. And that's ultimately what we will be studying as we spend time together. The chapter is entitled The Test of Discipleship. The Test of discipleship. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, as we gather in your holy name, we ask Lord God that the Spirit of God would fall upon us in this moment. We ask Lord that you would hide me behind the cross so that you and only you may be seen. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation in my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Test of Discipleship In the present day, the world has been shaken, perplexed, uh, things are upside down. It's been everything but regular, sometimes everything but comfortable. Now more than ever, people hate making commitments. And even if they make them, they have a hard time keeping them. Employee, employers cannot commit to the promises they made to their employees. Spouses break their commitment of till death do us part when things get rough. The churches have a hard time in getting their board members to commit to duty. The church members have a hard time in keeping their commitment to pay tithe. People have lost focus of their commitment in faith to God. Now, more than ever, people are failing to either make commitments or keep the commitments they made. I imagine that in his day, Jesus must have thought the same thing. Because it wasn't that he didn't have followers, it's that he had more tagalongs than followers. And tagging along with Jesus is one thing, but committing to him is something else. Let me elaborate the difference. People who tag along with Jesus want the benefits that come with being in his presence, but simultaneously want the option of stepping out when things get too rough. People with a tag-along mentality go to church when life spirals out of control, but then are out of church when life is back on track. People with a tag-along mentality only recognize God during divine service, but then forget about Him the rest of the day. People with this mentality will commit to a paycheck before they commit to God. But those who make a commitment to God have a mentality that I will worship him in the valley and I will worship him in the mountaintop. People who make a commitment to God have a mentality that I will praise him when the sun shines and I will praise him when the sun doesn't shine. Because commitment is not about the benefit or convenience. Commitment is about obedience. Hence, my submission to you this morning is, are you tagging along with Jesus or are you making your commitment to Jesus? I am persuaded to believe that the disciples are committers, not taggers. 
Moreover, discipleship is a lifestyle change. It is an holistic experience. For you cannot do what you've always done and still commit to what God wants you to do. You cannot claim a new life, an eternal life, while still hanging on to your old life. When God calls you to be a disciple, you lay down your aspirations for his holy inspiration. You would lay down what you think you know for what God wants you to know. Ultimately, you lay down your limited life for eternal life. And hence, our scripture says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, the new has come. I say this by way of introduction, that there is a test of discipleship. I submit to you this morning as my first point, no man can physically see the power of God, but every man will be a witness to the result of that power. You see, throughout his ministry, we see Jesus calling people to follow him, making them disciples. Not every man, woman, and child was called to follow him in the same way. Neither did they have the same interaction when they were called to follow. You see, James and John, they were seaside, uh, supposedly straightening out their nets, removing debris, and searching for any tears. Peter and Andrew were already in the water preparing to cast their net out of their boat. Matthew was called upon when he was sitting in his tax booth, updating his records, making sure that everyone paid their taxes to the state. Nicodemus came to him secretly in the night and made his commitment. Thieves came to their decision while still hanging on a cross, and Paul's experience was down a dusty road to Damascus. You see, not everyone has the same story to the point of their conversion, but everyone made the same decision. It must be made clear that discipleship does not just entail a literal following of Jesus. Discipleship involves a spiritual conversion. Ellen White makes a statement in the first paragraph that even when a person may not be able to tell the exact time or place or trace all the chain of circumstances in the process of conversion, still, this does not prove them to be unconverted. So we may not have the same story, but we ended up serving and following the same God. And even there lies the blessing because it proves that the mercies of God are new every morning. At some point in your life, for whatever reason and in whatever circumstance, your life required a change or even better yet, an upgrade. And there you encountered the hand of God. But unlike the disciples who had the experience of a physically appearing Jesus, what we have is a sense of the Spirit of God at work in our hearts. We don't physically see the power, but we sense and feel the result of that power. If I were to say it differently, I would say the work itself is intangible, but the result is tangible. You what you've been through, how far you have come, and who you have become are the tangible result of God's intangible work. But still, Ellen White says it better. She says, it is that regenerating power, which no human eye can see, that begets a new life in the soul. It creates a new image. It, it creates a new in the image of God. While the work of the Spirit is silent and imperceptible, its effects are manifest. If the heart has been renewed by the Spirit of God, the life will bear witness to the fact. It should be clearer now that the life you live is indicative of whether or not a conversion took place in your life. When a conversion takes place, a change will be seen in character, habits, and even pursuits. In other words, the conversion must be an indication that the grace of God has located us 
and our lives must resemble that. A disciple's life must reveal that the hand of God and his grace are hovering, circling and working. By ourselves, we can never accomplish a change of art. Only God can do that. We can never claim the righteousness of Christ. Only God can do that. We can never be made anew. Only God can do that. Though we cannot physically see the power of God, the result of that power will be made evident in you. But the question is, how do we identify a new creation? How do we identify someone who has been converted? And here Ellen White even provides us with the answer. Those who become new creatures in Christ Jesus will bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. They will no longer fashion themselves according to their former lusts, but by the faith of the Son of God, they will follow in His steps, reflect His character, and purify themselves even as He is pure. The things they once hated, they now love. The things they once loved, they now hate. The proud and self-assertive become meek and lowly in heart. The vain and supercilious become serious and unobtrusive. The drunken become sober. The, the vain customs and fashions of the world are laid aside. But here is the concluding thought to this. There is no evidence of genuine repentance unless it works reformation. Let me repeat that. There is no evidence of genuine repentance unless it works reformation. The second point I present to you this morning is that Christ's character is seen in his followers. Jesus was a teacher. He taught the scriptures and parables to his parishioners. He taught children of the love of God. He taught the disciples the methods of ministry. Hence, many called him rabbi, which means teacher. While he walked through the dusty streets and stood on hills, his responsibility was to teach. And his followers' responsibility was to learn. And that is why a disciple literally means learner. Learn by observing and learn by serving. The psychological impact is that while you observe the teacher, you begin to imitate the teacher and so become like the teacher. Where the teacher goes, you go. What the teacher does, you do. The way the teacher speaks, you begin to speak. His, his verbiage and sound now begins to resonate and reflect through you. The way the teacher moves, you pick up on and so begin to move. What you behold in your observance, in your observance of him, you become. And it is your relationship with the teacher that determines how far you replicate him. For if you have an in-depth relationship, you will have a greater resolution of the characteristics. If you have no relationship, well then, how can you imitate what you have not seen or known? If you want to have the mind of your teacher, you need to be spending time in his company. If you want to have the intellect of your teacher, you need to study and be determined to know what he knows. The relationship should be of such a standard that when people come across you, they see glimpses of the one who taught you. It is this depth of your relation to him that determines how much you will reflect him. What am I getting at here? If the character of Christ is to be seen in his followers or in his disciples, then it is the depth of the relation to the teacher that determines the reflection of the teacher. You need to spend time with your teacher to become like him or her. 
And if you don't spend time with him or her, then how can you expect to become like them? You need to know Christ the way he knew his father when he walked this earth. Everything the father was, he displayed and demonstrated on earth. And everything the father was, he was. And they were of one substance, made of, the, made of the same material. They exemplified these features and characteristics. That's why Jesus says to, to Timothy, How can you claim that you don't know the Father when you have seen me? If you have seen me, then you have seen the Father. The relationship between Jesus and the Father is the ultimate example of what a relationship should look like between us and Him. We need that constant connection in order to actualize an unbreakable relationship. It must be a relationship firmly grounded in love. That is why 1 John chapter 4 verse 19 says, We love because He first loved us. You see, we need to spend time with him and let the mind of Christ be in us. We need to spend time in his presence and become imitators of him. We need to spend time at his feet and so we will become like him. Ellen White says, The loveliness of the character of Christ must be seen in his followers. Love to God Zeal for his glory was the controlling power in our Savior's life. Love beautified and ennobled all his actions. Love is of God. The unconsecrated heart cannot originate or produce it. It is found only in the heart where Jesus reigns. In the heart renewed by divine grace, love is the principle of action. It modifies the character, governs the impulses, controls the passions, subdues enmity and ennobles the affections. This love, cherished in the soul, sweetens the life and sheds a refining influence on all around. The love of Christ we experience persuades us to change. And this process of change brings us to become more like him. And so too, love, it cause, and so too, it causes us to love those whom we come into contact with. Let me say this again. We can only love as Jesus loves once we have experienced that love for ourselves. And we can only be who Jesus is once we have seen him for ourselves. And we see and demonstrate this love of Christ by being obedient to the laws of God. We need to love the law of God. We need to express the words of the psalmist as he says, I love your law and I keep your precepts. But Ellen White also advises that we need to guard against the error that belief in Christ releases men from keeping the law of God. That since by faith alone we become partakers of the grace of Christ, our works have nothing to do with our redemption. But notice here that obedience is not a mere outward compliance, but it is the service of love. The law of God is an expression of his very nature. It is an embodiment of the great principle of love and hence the foundation of his government in heaven and earth. And here is how obedience to God's law works. Instead of releasing man from obedience, it is faith and only faith that makes us partakers of the grace of God, which then enables us to render obedience. You see, obedience, which is the service and allegiance of love, is the true sign of discipleship. And the true test that comes with discipleship is that if we abide in Christ, if the love of God dwells in us, our feelings, our thoughts, our purposes, even our actions, then we will be in harmony with the will of God as expressed in the precepts of his holy law. 
The third point I render to you at this point in time is that there is an escape route from imperfection to perfection. You see, there is nothing about us that touches righteousness. In no way can we claim self-righteousness when we are constantly in a state of sinfulness. Paul himself professed that he was the chief of sinners. But just like John the Baptist preached, there is a Lamb of God that takes away the sin of this world. You see, we have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of the law of God. But Christ, Christ has made a way of escape for us. He died for us and now he offers to take our sins and give us his righteousness. If you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake, you are accounted righteous. So we have nothing in ourselves of which to boast, except that we should glory in the cross. Again, I quote, our only ground of hope is in the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. The blood of Christ redeems us. But let me put it to you differently. In the ancient Hebraic time, there were three stages to marriage. The first stage was the signing of the contract, which creates a marital bond. You see, the bride-to-be would choose a husband for herself. Her father and the groom-to-be would sign this contract. Now, technically, they would be 100% married, but the process or the, the process of consummation would not have commenced at this point in time. It is only in stage two and three where there will be a physical consummation. And so up to seven years later, the groom is able to raise up money as set out in the contract. And so he then notifies the father of the bride, who then sets a date of when the consummation will be at the bride's home. So the bride would wait with her maidens for the arrival of the groom and his companions. Once he has arrived, the couple would enter into a room and there the consummation of process, or the consummation of the marriage would begin. The companions and the bride's maidens would be either outside or uh, celebrating or in the next room. The groom, once the process is complete, the groom hands the bloodied sheet, which is called the proof of virginity cloth. He hands it to the witnesses who then give it to the bride for safekeeping. Now this proof of virginity cloth was a sign that she was pure. The problem comes in that when there is no blood on this cloth, that there is an indication that somewhere along the way to marriage, purity was lost. And this problem resonates with us because when the time comes for us to enter into a holy communion with the Father for an eternity, we will have no proof of purity because of our sinful nature, which did not allow for that. But it is then that the love of Christ stands in our stead. Because when our cases are presented to the Father, Christ points to his own blood that was shed. It was his death on the cross that makes us faultless before the throne of God. Because of his death on the cross, it is his blood that is placed on that proof of virginity cloth. So that the Father will see his perfection, his blood, his sacrifice, and not our faults. He presents his blood on the cloth. And the Father sees that we are covered by his blood. And so giving us the escape route from imperfection to perfection. We have a reason to give praise. Because Christ's character stands in place of our character. And you are accepted before the Father as if you had not sinned. Right now, Christ is at the right hand of God, making 
intercession for us. You see, the true test of discipleship is this. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you appear in your own eyes. But the closer you come to Jesus, the more like him you become. By the grace of God, we are called his disciples. By his love, we become like him. The less we esteem, uh, we, the less we see to esteem in ourselves, the more we shall see to esteem in the infinite purity and loveliness of our Savior. A view of our sinfulness drives us to him who can pardon us. And when the soul, realizing its helplessness, reaches out after Christ, he will reveal himself in power. The more our sense of need drives us to him and to the word of God, the more exalted views we shall see of his character and the more fully we shall reflect his image. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to, com- we want to make a commitment to you daily. The saying, Lord, that we will follow hard after you, that we will be in pursuit of you because of your relentless love for us. Because of your love that doesn't run out, neither does it give up on us we thank you that we are covered by the blood of christ and we more so thank you for the sacrifice that was made lord each day we seek to draw from that inexhaustible fountain of grace father may we be like you may we be imitators of you May we have the same mind as you so that we can do your mission, so that we can be about our father's business and so that we can one day spend an eternity with you. These things we ask and pray, not because we are worthy, but in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen.
Thank you.